All right, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna go ahead and begin. May I have a roll call, please? Clark. Clark. Present. Dutra. Here. Montesino. Here. Orozco. Parker. Here. Salcido. Here. And Pitos Carter. Here. We have quorum. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, good morning, and thank you all for joining us on a Saturday. Um, we are here for our second meeting on houselessness, and um, this is a super critical issue, not only here in Watsonville, but all across the state. Um, we know that this is a really challenging issue, but um, we want to be able to address it in ways that um, will make us stronger. And we know that it not only affects people who are houseless, but it affects the entire community. So we're here to try to come up with solutions. Um, this is a challenging issue, as I said before, but we do have to work together. And I really wanna focus on solutions. What can we do? We're not here to complain about things. We're not here to talk about, um, you know, we're, we're not here to just complain. We're here to really think critically, work together, and try to solve this issue in our community. We can't solve it for all of California, but we can work together to make our community a little bit better for everyone. So thank you. I know it's gonna be um, a great meeting today. We have a lot planned for you. We have a lot of um, discussion planned, so we wanna get everyone's input. Um, but before we begin, I've asked that we have some agreements um, as I said, we are not here just to complain. We're not here to just talk about one issue. Um, we're here to talk about this issue as a whole. So I have a few agreements. If I can get the next slide, please. And I would like these agreements to guide our discussion. So as you can see, the first one is be respectful. Second is stay on topic, work together towards solutions, listen with curiosity and compassion, speak with intention and use I statements. So in community circles, um, we usually have some kind of community agreements. So that's why I wanted to bring this forth because we're wanting this to really be community based. And again, we're all working together. So I want us to um, work together, be respectful and use these agreements to guide our discussion. All right, with that being said, I am looking forward to all of the talks we're going to have today and what we can come up with together. And I am going to turn it over to City Manager Vivek. Can I get a quick clicker? Okay, so while we, while we get a clicker, I'll stand here um, to manage technology. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Tamara Vives, uh, Watsonville City City Manager, and uh, thank you, Mayor. It's, I hear my voice. Why is that? Can you hear me? No. Because <laughs> I'm here and I'm hearing myself really loud. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So I just. Um, want to first thank everybody. I mean, council, thank you, and members of our community, thank you for being here this morning. It's a beautiful Saturday in early fall, and there are a lot of things that we could be doing, but we're here, and I'm really excited, and hopefully um, staff has worked really hard to put an agenda together that really engages us in conversation, again, that are that will hopefully be solution-oriented, and uh, for that agenda, I wanna I wanna cover what we're gonna be doing in the next four hours together. We're gonna take uh, the first hour of the morning, really diving into background. Where have we been? Where are we are today? And just really understand what is it that we're talking about. We're gonna have an opportunity to work in community to really kind of brainstorm what is solving the problem of homelessness means for our community. So as we go through the background, I want you to start thinking about that question because we're going to have a break um, breakout session to really dive into that. And then back in March, we have the opportunity to predetermine 
some uh, themes that the city could really focus on when um, understanding or addressing homelessness in our community. We're gonna really take time to di dive deeper into those themes. And we definitely invite your voices um, to um, come out as we brainstorm what are our future opportunities that we need to include in our plan. And then we're gonna spend some time with the council after we prioritize feedback that is obtained this morning and really get direction from the council as to next steps. So that should be our day today and our agenda. I just wanna, by way of background, just really um, start acknowledging that this work is not starting today. We started back in March when we had our first homelessness workshop in this very room. Many, many of us were here then. We had the opportunity to determine what are the areas in which we want Watsumo to focus on. And those are the four that we're diving deeper on today. Uh, last council meeting in the month of September, the council had an opportunity to hear from our county partners and really uh, spent about a couple hours uh, doing a study session where we dive uh, more into uh, what it, why are people experiencing homelessness, what are what are what is um, kind of like what is the data telling us? And we heard both from uh, Dr. Robert Ratner from the Housing for Health Division of uh, Santa Cruz County, as well as Monica Morales and Karen, Karen I believe is the director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we we obtained we had some data and opportunity to learn together. And today is their second workshop. Um, building an action plan, it's it's where we want to focus on today. So I, I want to invite everyone to to really think about action, actions that the city can take. I want us to leave here with some really um, good idea of what we can do. And when I say we, I'm not speaking about the city of Watson. I'm speaking about the collective we that is in this room. Because it's not just the role of the Watson city alone, it's our collective role where what could help us make a difference. So I, um, I would encourage all of you to bring your voices, your perspectives, your, your stories, and your ideas, and listen to each other as we create together this roadmap of action. We're gonna understand more in depth uh, what each team is, and then we're going to uh, be able to share with the members of the public and the council, what are some areas that we already are doing to support these um, themes, and again, public input on the opportunities. I wanna cover really quickly, when we ask you for public input, we're gonna be taking this approach. What can we do differently? So as you hear this information, ask yourself, what can we do differently? Something that we're already doing that we can be more effective in doing something, if we tweak it a little bit, uh, think about those things. Uh, what can we do if we had a, if we had no additional funding? But what opportunities do we have? How can we use our creativity and our collective power? And then what can we do if we had additional funding? So those three questions I, we're going to ask you repeatedly four times today. In each of those the the four themes, what can we do differently? What can we do if more fund if no more funding is available? And what can we do if funding was available? I wanna ground our conversation with who we are and what we are part of. We are part of the Santa Cruz County, um, City of Watson was part of Santa Cruz County. Santa Cruz County has adopted a Housing for Health uh, a strategic plan. Watson is part of that. Watson has for a long time been at the table, uh, the COC working uh, hand in hand with, with Dr. Ratner and his team in advancing um, best practices to, to combat homelessness in our county. And, and I wanna lift that up uh, because it's important that we acknowledge uh, as a, a little bit of the, um, today's framework, this is not work that anyone, no person, no organization, no city or county can do alone. This is, this is all of us can do it together. The homeless plan that we create 
just similarly as the Santa Cruz County Housing for Health um, strategic plan will be used to align, coordinate, and collaborate to accomplish the shared goals that we that we have in this room to solve homelessness in our community. We will endeavor to utilize strategies and programs that have proven success, best practices, and uh, and support everyone in our community to secure permanent housing. So I want to lift those uh, the strategic plan of the Housing for Health just as, as a foundation for building our action plan. With that, uh, like I said, our, our theme, uh, Dr. Ratner, I think you follow me. So if you want to, you can come here if you like. Um, since you have a couple slides, I've invited Dr. Ratner to uh, kind of ground us a little bit on the data and then staff uh, will then take it from there and um, continue providing background information. So. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this workshop. And uh, thank you, Tamana, for the invitation and really appreciate the spirit of what you just shared that this is a really complex, challenging issue. The fact that we don't have enough safe places for people to live and the right kinds of supports, and we all got to work on this together. So I was asked to give a little bit of a refresher for some members of the council and public on some data, what we know about homelessness in Watsonville um, and in the county in general. And some of the data we have is based on the survey of people around the state. So one approach we use in the understanding of who's experiencing homelessness is to follow something called the HUD point in time count. So that's a survey that's done at least every two years. Our community is now doing it every year. It involves a survey, a visual survey of people who are living unsheltered throughout the community. And we count people geographically. And then there is a sampling a, a survey where people go for tw 25, 30 minutes through a series of questions and we collect data that way. So the last survey we did was in January of uh, 2024. And what we found in Watsonville was there were 90 sheltered individuals. So at that time, the Salvation Army shelter was open. I think they had 17 or 18 people. And all the other sheltered individuals that were counted were in family shelters. Um, so they were households with adults and children. And then the vast majority of folks who were counted were unsheltered. Most of the unsheltered people that were observed were sleeping along the Paho River in two census tracts. So the way we do the point in time count is we send out volunteers with guides to canvas the whole census tract they're assigned. And so there were two census tracts that had the bulk of the unsheltered people. Uh, so unsheltered homelessness was very concentrated at that time. Uh, in general, over the years that I've been working in the county, Watsonville tends to have higher rates of homelessness among youth. And when I say youth, I mean 18 to 24 year olds and families, adults with children under 18. And when you look at the types of living situations that people have when they're unsheltered, other parts of the county have more people living in vans, cars and RVs than Watsonville. So in Watsonville, Historically, more people are living in tents, in abandoned buildings, and without any kind of shelter whatsoever. Um, the uh, data on where were people living before, this is a question I'm often asked, before they <coughs> became homeless and lost their housing. So in, in the last survey, we found 86% of people were last housed within Santa Cruz County and about a fourth were last housed in Watsonville, 26%. And looking at state data, but it's also similar to what I um, see in our data and anecdotally, most people who enter homelessness first are living with family or friends or some kind of doubled up living situation where they don't have a lease or they um, don't have an ownership stake in a property. So they're living with others. And if that relationship gets challenged for some reason, it's overcrowded or they can't afford that place anymore, folks then slip into homelessness. Another large group of folks, 20%, uh, and that's true in our data and statewide, are coming from an institution. So leaving jail or prison or some kind of healthcare institution, skilled nursing facility, 
where they have a temporary place to be, but then there's nowhere for them to go afterwards. So I think understanding where people are before they become homeless will help with the conversations later today around prevention, because we need to know that information so we can work, we often use the phrase upstream. Um, so a lot of folks have assumptions about people experiencing homelessness. I, I often hear they're lazy, they don't wanna work. Well, in our community, more than um, one out of four people are actually working. Uh, I've met people who work in city and county jobs who haven't been able to afford a place to live. So a subset of people experiencing homelessness are actually working many full time and can't afford the cost of housing. Some of you know from other studies, the National Low Income Housing Coalition looked at the fair market rents in Santa Cruz County and you need to earn about 80 bucks an hour to afford a two bedroom. So a lot of jobs we have in this community are not at that rate. So there's just an affordability issue that's a huge part of why people struggle with housing and homelessness. I think it's important to remember that a significant percentage of people end up on the streets because they're fleeing an unsafe situation. Domestic violence um, impacts people's overall safety, well-being, and their housing stability. And then folks who are in the foster care system, historically, or who are exiting the foster care system, are more likely to end up homeless. And then the graphic on the left shows how common certain health conditions are. Health conditions are much more common among people experiencing homelessness for two reasons. One, if you have health issues, it's often harder to be able to keep housing and certain types of health issues can create more challenges for individuals, particularly health issues that affect your ability to do the daily living things you need to do to keep housing, pay your bills, be a good neighbor, keep your room clean. Uh, if you have behavioral health issues, mental health or substance use issues, issues affecting the brain, or things that prevent you from getting out of bed and managing those daily living tasks, those can make it hard for you to maintain housing. And if you don't have housing, uh, it's much harder to sleep, it's much harder to take care of your well being. So just being homeless can contribute to higher rates of health issues. So it goes both directions. What I mean by that is, Certain health conditions can increase the risk of people in an unaffordable place like we have here of losing housing. But once you're without housing, the health issues get exacerbated and it's much more difficult for people to get back into a stable situation. I think it's important to know that folks were surveyed to get this data and more than half of people said they had a disabling set of health conditions that make it hard for them to get back into housing and to keep housing on their own. So that to me reminds us that we really need to think about services to support people. So housing alone isn't gonna help people address those health issues. We need to combine the right set of health and other services to help people to get back into housing. And this data comes from that point in time count that I mentioned, and it shows changes between 2023 and 2024. And you can see that the well, you can't see this here. Well, I can, actually you can. <laughs> so the 2023 to 2024, uh, roughly overall in the county, the numbers stayed relatively the same. We had a big drop uh, between 2022 and 2023. I personally believe the reason we had such a big drop in the number of people experiencing homelessness is we had a big surplus of housing vouchers. What I mean by that is housing subsidies that help make housing affordable for people living on really low incomes. And that money came from the federal government as pandemic assistance. We also had money to provide support. So we had this big bolus or burst of money that helped us get people into housing with services. And then we saw a reduction, not surprising to me, in the numbers of people experiencing homelessness, but that money was used up, those slots were used up. So we kind of flatlined again. So if we can get another bolus of resources, I think we'll see progress. But there's also other things we can do to improve our overall efforts, even without that extra money. But I think the, the big thing that really struck me is that uh, the city of Santa Cruz saw a significant drop. Uh, and they've historically been investing more in this issue of housing and homelessness, and they've been working in partnership with our office and others to make some changes. Uh, they've also gotten their own state resources, some of you know, that helped contribute to them being able to, I think, make more progress on this issue. But the other parts of the county, we saw an increase in homelessness, especially in Watsonville. So I think one of the reasons why we're here today is to really think about 
how can we ramp up our collective efforts specifically in the city of Watsonville so we can see the same kinds of reductions that we saw in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, as a county employee, you can see I, I represent the whole county, but the unincorporated parts of the county also saw an increase. So we in the county family also need to have a conversation like this about what can we do in those unincorporated areas to see the same kind of progress. So I think passing off. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm Mary Wagner. I'm with the city attorney's office. And I'm going to set the stage a little bit about the legal, legal landscape, which we're dealing with um, with unhoused individuals. So it starts, as you all well know, with Martin v. Boise, which is a Ninth Circuit Court of um, Decision that was issued in 2018, which held that the Eighth Amendment prohibits, prohibits ordinance enforcement, um, city ordinances, if those ordinances criminalize homeless individuals for sleeping outside when they have no access to alternative shelter. The decision in Martin um, was further complicated, if you will, uh, when COVID-19 hit and the CDC order came out, um, sorry, I'm echoing to myself, so it's like really disconcerting. Um, so it was complicated with the pandemic and the CDC rules regarding uh, disbursement of homeless individuals <clears throat> and, disper and disbursement of encampments. But Martin is no longer the law of the land. Um, now the US Supreme Court has issued its decision in the Grants Pass case where the court determined um, overruling Martin that um, the Eighth Amendment does not, that they reason that the Eighth Amendment allows the government to criminalize conduct that flows from a condition that a defendant might be powerless to change. And um, now we can enforce ordinances without them violating the um, Eighth Amendment. I want to talk a little bit about also the governor's executive order, executive order uh, N124. So this was issued July 25th of 2024 by Governor Newsom. And um, basically, Governor Newsom signed into law ordering state agencies and departments to adopt and prioritize enforcing policies that effectively dismantle homeless encampments. And this was in response specifically to the court's decision in uh, the Grants Pass case. So what the order says is that uh, these state agencies are required to adopt policies that are essentially consistent. Sorry, I don't want to get there. Essentially consistent with the um, Caltrans policies and the priorities in which they disperse encampments on Caltrans properties. And the the governor um, included five priorities in those policies. First, uh, to determine and assess whether the encampment poses an imminent threat to life, safety, or infrastructure, so that there are ex exigent circumstances that require the immediate removal of the encampment. Where such circumstances exist, the entities are required to give as much notice as possible to the unhoused individuals before the encampment is cleared. If there are not exigent circumstances, 48 hours notice is required, which is a little different than what most cities were doing, which was generally a 72 hour enforcement unless there were significant health and safety issues. Then they also require contacting service providers and then storing, excuse me, storing materials that are left by the homeless individuals. And that is consistent with what most uh, cities have been doing with respect to enforcement. So I'll stop there just to set the kind of stage of what the city can and cannot do under the current legal framework. That's much easier. I wouldn't have dropped all my papers if I could have done that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> can you hear me okay from this little microphone? Okay. What's my... Oh, we got a clicker. 
Thank you. So I'm going to go through some of the conditions and impact. Um, it has a direct impact on all the different departments, and they, they all tie together, but I'm going to talk about public work. I'll introduce myself. Sorry, I'm Courtney Lindbergh. I'm the director of public works and utilities. Um, it's a little awkward with you guys behind me, so I'm trying to make sure. Maybe I can just hold it like this and talk to you. Does that work? OK. Where do I go? So what we want to see here um, is, I got I to gotta walk with it. Um, what we see here are real pictures. This is this is Watsonville. These are um, you can see on the top and the bottom. These are uh, examples of some destruction. The one on the top, you can see that's a car that's um, covered and and fences that are broken. And so, uh, basically, this is just telling a story of this is what our city is looking like right now, and just kind of showing the overall degradation of parts of the environment. Next. So did I skip a slide? That was it? OK, it's just a little, got a little delay to it. So what I want to highlight absolutely is that we do not do this alone. We have rely on partnerships. We have Watsonville Works, Hope Services, Watsonville Wetlands Watch, Pitch in Santa Cruz. And uh, most recently, we worked with Community Tree when we did the levee cleanup, which I'll talk about in a little bit more over the summer. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's a lot of hard work. This is probably one day. And if you went back a couple days later, it would be as it never happened. So these are some examples. All these pictures um, also are, with, are within the last three months. So these are all very real, relevant, recent pictures. Um, and you can just see, it basically, the, the only correlation is that this is our city. These were taken by our, our staff and, and cleaning up these things. Uh, so, you know, some of them, like the second one, you can just see like it's that's what happens when we don't address vegetation. It becomes thicker. It becomes more dense. It becomes very difficult to manage, to control, to see. So all of these, it's so multifaceted when it comes to um, where they're going and what they see. You cannot see this when you drive by on on the street up over the levee. You can see it somewhat when you're driving by Safeway and you can kind of see some of the traffic going in and out. But to go in it, raise your hand if you've ever gone in, in it and seen either the inside the levee or inside, yeah. So it's, um, it's not seen by the majority of the public. So this is some more examples. Um, the bottom is pretty, uh, I think pretty, gets to be kind of scary. You know, these are all propane tanks that they're taking. You can see hundreds of bikes and they were trying to hide them from us by putting them in the water. But then if you look at the next picture, that then killed fish. And so we're seeing a lot of dead um, fish and animals in that area because we're seeing some, some severe environmental destruction, um, pollution that we have trouble combating without doing aggressive cleanups. Um, in addition to that, there were some structural integrity issues with the levee, with um, digging caves and tunnels and uh, thinking about the potential destruction that that could pose for Watsonville is something that brings me a lot of concern. So here's the levee. This was um, a before and after that we took with some drone footage. Uh, the importance of the after is um, the a lot of the vegetation removal that gives a, a little bit better uh, view. So for management oversight, so you don't have to go down in all the way to kind of get an idea of what's going on. So just to give a glimpse, it's just a snapshot of what we did in July. Um, and July is important because July was the result of us not having done regular cleanups for five months. So this is what happens when we do nothing for five months. Um, we paid community tree to come in and limb up. We didn't want to kill the trees. Absolutely don't want to kill the trees, but we want to limb them up so we can see in. Uh, we want to make sure that we are controlling the vegetation, not only for uh, encampments and control, but also um, defensible space with, with fire and making sure that we're not creating a, a place that would be ready to burn easily. 
We used employees from Public Works, we used employees from Parks, and obviously from our police department to help us down there with enforcement and cleanup. Uh, Perifma came in and had a contract with Koala Tree to help us go faster for these cleanups. Um, and I say faster because we were paying uh, overtime for police officers for this day. So this was a, in an effort to be economically conscientious. It wasn't faster for us to like get in there faster. It was just every hour had a cost to it. Uh, Connex boxes, as the previous speaker just said, we store uh, belongings for a long period of time. There's a required amount and then we double it just to give more time. So we had to purchase those boxes to make sure that we could store things safely. Um, the storage needs on city facilities, and then just the trash disposal fees of what we pulled out of the levy was uh, over $33,000 just to throw things away. So there's some real costs. And then we, you know, for you to understand for 10 day levy cleanup for the overtime was, you know, just about $20,000 for the police that's unbudgeted. So it's these little bits, I mean, little bits, 20,000, 33,000 are not little bits, but they add up quickly and we don't have a, a regular sustainable funding source for this level of effort. And with that, I'll switch it over to Mish. I'm gonna try to find the other microphone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mish Radich. I'm a captain with the police department. Um, I'm just going to go over a few things that have come up. We've had some uh, neighborhood district meetings. We had one in District 1. We had one in District 7. We had one in District 6, counting fingers. Um, trying to think if there was anyone else. I know we have one coming up, I think, in District 5. But um, there's public safety concerns that, come up that are related to homelessness um, that we see a lot in our District 1 area and District 7. We see them along the levee. We see them in our sloughs. Um, there's nuisance and just quality of life issues that come with homelessness. Some of the trash that piles up, the shopping carts, the abandoned cars, oversized vehicles. Um, we also respond to crimes in progress relating our homeless population, a lot of which is derived from people that are uh, suffer from mental illness or drug addiction, substance abuse. Um, we recognized after the March meeting, we needed to improve our data tracking. So the heat map that you see uh, to the left on the slide is derived from data that we're starting to collect now of hotspots where we see homelessness. So on the bottom of the slide, I'll point this out. It's kind of our downtown area. Um, up here, this is Freedom Boulevard. Um, we see a lot of stuff, Freedom and Green Valley, that there was a large encampment that we cleared out uh, across from Safeway. And then this is Main Street as a heads up. So this is our slough areas, Ramsey Park, and such, and then you can see it's really concentrated downtown, up Main Street towards Green Valley Road, and then up Freedom Boulevard towards uh, airport and the city limit that way. So our response capabilities, we're, we're extremely shortly staffed from a sworn end at the police department. So our patrol officers do respond to a lot of these calls. Our care team, we have a mental health liaison from the county that works with us daily. On weekdays, um, she responds to some of these calls where there is mental illness involved. And then we have a new program, which I'll highlight a little later, which is a, uh, we have a police service specialist position. They're not a police officer. They wear a uniform just like mine, but it's a light blue shirt. They're not armed with a firearm. They do have a taser for self-defense if needed, but it's a softer approach. Um, and they're gonna partner with a new position from Community Action Board, which is a homeless services navigator to proactively contact homeless people, figure out who they are, where they came from, why they're on the street, and then focus services around what, what they need. CAB has a whole tool bag of services that are available to them. We're partnering with them for those services to uh, hopefully get some of these people off the street. I keep saying there's a workforce out there. We just need to clean them up mm -hmm. and get them back on track. Um, everyone's hiring, we know that. The economy is pretty good right now. Inflation is high, but everybody's hiring at the same time. So this is community data that's gathered. If you call our, our non-emergency number, or if you call 911 for not a violent crime, at 7 p.m. that day, if you call from a cell phone, you'll get a text message 
with a survey. That survey is sent out in any language that the phone is programmed to. So if your phone is programmed in English, you get in English. If your phone is programmed in Spanish, you'll get in Spanish. If it's in another language, you'll get it in that language. So this is community data that's gathered since the last meeting um, between April 1st and September 30th. Um, we can see overall homelessness is second place and then other quality of life issues. A lot of them which are derived from homelessness is in first. And then there's a breakdown on the next slide month to month. Um, so earlier, again, in, in uh, April, May, homelessness is number one. And then as we move into June, noise comes higher. We deal with a lot of fireworks complaints in June. So that's higher, but homelessness is still up here. Um, July skyrockets because of fireworks. And then it's starting to come down. But again, homelessness is always like number one or number two as we move on. Gun violence is something we see a lot less of. These days, it's way at the bottom, and that's that's where it should belong. Um, we shouldn't have to deal with that problem in our community. Uh, these are just a couple quick body cam uh, slides that we created from our levy cleanup. While we were in the first days of the levy cleanup, we were contacted by PB Shelter. They told us, hey, we have space right now for seven to nine women um, or three families. We knew um, from our... <clears throat> previous um, workups on the levy of what we were going to encounter, that there was no families living down there, which is a good thing. We knew there was women down there. We went down there with uh, PB Shelter and their uh, staff. We contacted women. Unfortunately, no one would take them up on the offer. There was one woman that we did contact that said she had just secured housing, and we had spoken to the same woman two days prior, um, and she didn't have housing, but she received a voucher for the, the uh, apartments that are being built on Miles Lane. So that's a good thing. But again, there, there's a place, but no one willing to go sometimes. And we realize it takes multiple attempts with the same person to finally get them over to the service side. On the next slide, this is a quote that came. So when you get this My 90 survey, you can fill in like... Uh, anything you want at the end after you answer all the questions. So this is something that a uh, respondent sent in in June. It just said the officers treated the homeless person who was trespassing with dignity and respect. I was nervous to call because I didn't want the person to be harassed. I just needed them to move off my property. I'm grateful for the professionalism of the police officers. So we do treat these people with dignity and respect. We do understand they're at the worst time of their life um, and we're contacting them pretty much on the worst day of their life right? Because the last thing they want to do is have interaction with us. We understand that. Um, we're providing resources to them on paper, but that's the most we can do as a police department. That's why we're collaborating now with Community Action Board to kind of up that level of service because they have a, a lot of services that they can provide as well. Um, we partner with our public works department continually for years on doing, um, we have an officer that works with them for, for scene security purposes and to clear out the encampments before they clear them out. Last year was $47,000 in overtime. This year we're over 60 already, 19 of which was just used in, in two weeks to do the levy cleanup because of the number of personnel that were needed. Our enforcement capabilities, we have some municipal codes that we can enforce that are infractions. It's like a traffic ticket that prohibit campsites anywhere in the city. There's one specific to our parks. There's no camping permitted in any park other than Pinto Lake City Park, but it's only RV camping that's permitted there. So there's no tent camping <clears throat> permitted anywhere in the city. Um, there's a, a penal code for that prohibits lodging without consent of public or private property. There's also various trespassing codes that we can use. 602M is the most common for enter or occupying property without consent. 602.1 is one that's uh, when we have people that are refusing to leave a business or they're camping out of business or causing some type of disturbance at the business and they're refusing to leave. And then there's other law violations that we come across when uh, investigating some of these things. People can be drunk in public, high, different things like that. I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Avila from the fire department. Uh, I'm going to stand over here. Good morning, uh, Tom Avila, Fire Division Chief, Watsville Fire Department. 
uh, to speak on um, on our topic as it relates to the fire department and a little bit our, about our community. So the data uh, that we're sharing here this morning is for the period from the beginning of this year through September 2024. And um, the picture you see is a very common uh, incident that our fire department experiences um, very, very often. As you can see, uh, fire-related incidents is 254 up through September 24th. Um, and I appreciate uh, the information shared so far because um, this is what we go into at night with the uh, unknowns into these areas uh, related to the, the, the people in the areas, what they have stored there, the fuels, and, and so on. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Um, so for this time period, you can see that the biggest part of the pie chart is our emergency medical uh, calls and a little over 500 for this nine month period. Total incidents related to the homeless issue is um, 776. And in comparison to total call volume for the fire department during the same period, uh, we had over 4,500 calls. So the 776 represents about 70% of our calls up to that point um, responding to issues with um, or incidents related to homelessness. Um, so going in, into these areas, um, not only during the daytime, the, the, the hazard is still there, uh, but also at night, um, there's, there is uh, fire personnel safety concerns, but I'll speak mo first about the community. So the fire, fire departments and the fire service, our main mission, our goal is to protect life, property, and the environment. And, and that's our job, that's our, that's our mandate. Um, as, as you saw, most of our calls in the, for um, under this issue are medical emergencies, and we do have uh, we do have our fire apparatus in the county. We do have our ambulance service in the county, um, but right now our ambulance service is experiencing some um, some staffing challenges, which means which converts to less ambulances to provide service in the county. So what does this mean? For the for our most prevalent calls, um, it takes an ambulance to get to us and transport that patient um, sooner than later. So, or they get the later than sooner. So what that what that means and uh, how it affects the fire department. Uh, first, I'd like to say our department we have three fire units in the city, staffed 24 hours a day, and a battalion chief. It is very often that all three of our units. Um, are out on separate calls um, on on days, on most days, uh, very often. So when one of our fire units is extended on a call because we're waiting for an ambulance from the northern part of the county, then our fire unit is um, less available uh, to respond to another incident. So the next step would be relying on our adjacent fire agencies to come and help respond to our incidents and they are all outside the city limits, and which means their response time to our incident is going to be even uh, longer. Um, again, related to community is air quality. You saw earlier the, the vegetation fire creates smoke, not only from the vegetation, uh, but also from the items that the homeless encampments have, uh, tarps, fuels, um, all these other different um, products, when they burn their, um, their products of combustion, uh, they, um, they create um, more dangerous smoke because of the plastics involved. So there's a smoke issue for air quality. Um, and then as you can see, it's in, um, in the protected slough areas, what so affects life, uh, wildlife. Um, and then also when we extinguish these fires um, the vegetation fires are somewhat challenging because it, it it involves grass brush trees and um, a lot of duff and so what our goal is we have to make sure that our water uh, penetrates the area well enough uh, to make sure that the fire will not re reignite and we use a foam product that is biodegradable 
um, to help us do that. But it is another product that's being introduced into the slough areas that we'd rather not do. Um, fire personnel safety concerns. Again, walking into these areas uh, to provide medical services or put out a fire or help somebody. Uh, what we've what we've experienced so far uh, is a violence, assault, and weapons. Um, this photo here is a photo from a police officer's body cam. Uh, this is after police officers arrived. Our fire personnel were um, assaulted, and in order to protect themselves, uh, they had to detain the subject. And then the police officer arrived and uh, arrested the individual. Uh, recently, we had reports of uh, a homeless person throw a hammer at our crew members. And then uh, some other safety concerns is when we walk into these areas, again, very dark, a lot of unknowns um, that Courtney mentioned that there's biohazards, feces, body fluids, uh, drug needles, and then the associated smoke. Um, and, and yes, the vegetation fires, not, not so much, but you saw a picture of underneath the bridge. We've had to go under a bridge to extinguish your fire and check for victims. And that's uh, our company officers are having to, to evaluate the risk versus the benefit in those situations. Um, so walking into these places, we are susceptible to injuries. Um, as Courtney mentioned, a lot of these folks dig out, undermine the, the creek banks, the levee banks, and all that stuff is not engineered. So uh, the risk of it collapsing on them and on us is, is real. Um, there was one report, the false floor, there was one report where a tarp was laid on the ground and it appeared it, it was just that, a tarp on the ground. It was actually a ceiling for a void. So had we just walked across it, we would have fell in and got injured also. Um, and then also, as Courtney had mentioned, the unknown fuel, propane, camp stove fuel, um, and, and who knows what they're burning to, to stay warm and cook their food. So uh, I did want to also share that our associated costs related to this, not overtime, but we had 200, 200 hours uh, for this time period with staff hours. And that's, um, a little over seventy-one thousand dollars in staff costs to to manage up through uh, associated with this nine-month period. So that that's what I have on fire. Thank you, Nate. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna follow Tom's lead and stand on the corner over here. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Kalabakib. I'm the Parks and Community Services Director for the City of Watsonville. Um, just got to talk real quickly. I've just got one slide on the impact to our parks and recreation system um, here in our community. Um, so in, in Parks and Community Services, we're all about prevention, um, providing positive programs and, and safe spaces. Um, our, um, our, 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 our parks and, and our programs really uh, promote uh, mental and physical health for our community and um, the, the impact um, of, of the unhoused situation here in our community has, 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 several, um, has several impacts on kind of our ability to, to create community, um, the sense of safety within our parks and the cleanliness, of course. Um, we're currently spending about 2,000 annual staff hours on, um, on maintenance and um, fixing things that, that, that are broken and so forth, which amounts to about $100,000 um, that doesn't account for kind of accelerated wear and tear on things like restrooms and play equipment and, 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 and the like. Um, but it's, it, it comes at a great cost. And so um, it, it's, it's an everyday occurrence that we're cleaning up things like needles and, and feces and, and so forth in our, in our parks. And it really has a, has a profound effect on, on how our community kind of perceives and also um, experiences that the, the you know kind of the sense of safety within these spaces. Um, I think we we all know that many of our, our young people, especially, live in in places like apartment buildings and kind of high density housing, and a lot of times don't have backyards um, where they live. And so the, these these spaces like parks and open spaces become the backyards for for many folks. And um, there are several parks throughout our community that that um, are, are currently you know kind of quote unquote overrun. Um, by impacts to to uh, or, or from from the unhoused, and um, you know, we've heard from several community members that they just don't feel safe to to go to those spaces. So, um, I mean, our, our biggest defense really is to to continue to build um, kind of defensible spaces that um, are easy to clean and um, 
hold up and, and stand the test of time, but all of that comes at an additional expense um, beyond kind of the, the $100,000 that we're spending today on, um, on everyday maintenance and so forth. Um, so that's just my little piece. I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Alicia. Good morning, everyone. Alicia Martinez, Library Director. And just wanna let you know that um, these are what, you know, the library is a welcoming space. And we also do provide prevention in the sense uh, we welcome everyone in our space. And so we do have a lot of these um, vulnerable populations in our library, but we provide services by offering charging stations for their cell phones, because wherever they're at, they don't have this form of capability. Uh, we offer internet services. We provide materials for them. Even if they don't have a library card, they can get on as a guest. So we try to provide programs and also offer services and resources to also help them. Um, and as part of that is the staff is also trained to form this type of community engagement with empathy and sympathy. And also be all we always reaching out to these local agencies and nonprofit organizations and trying to get these individuals into other um, forms of resources. Unfortunately, since there are no showers or places where people can come in and, and you know gyms that allow people to come in and take a shower, we have a lot of these individuals in our bathrooms also um, showering. And so it's kind of awkward when you have a multi-purpose bathroom and then a little boy walks in and you know, and so we're always constantly monitoring this and leaving the doors open and making sure that everyone is welcome and safe. What does this cost us? It does really impact the building because we do see a lot of feces, urine around our book drops, around the outside of the building, which the crew of the city um, of public works does come by and clean and, and all and that. But it's a constant every day that we have to make sure that not only the inside of our building, but the outside is a welcoming space. That costs up to 50000 uh, annually. Um, we put in some traps in our bathrooms because that was our major issue is they were clogging our restrooms and were causing a lot of sewer problems, not just for our two floors, but for the whole entire building and the uh, other businesses around our facility. And so, but that has kind of minimized, but we still get a lot of graffiti, a lot of broken toilets, faucets, they take the hand soap dispensers and I'm sure Parks is in the same <laughs> situation, but we need to be able to find some other way to be able to um, make sure that these ongoing maintenance issues are um, be able to be afforded. In regards to staff, we are kind of like the silent social workers. We didn't really go to school to be social workers, but we're kind of in that role. So when people walk in, they really get a one-on-one -on -one ex experience. So we provide ongoing de-escalation training to our staff to ensure not only the safety of our personnel, but the safety of the individual. And we wanna make sure that we are uh, conscientious of what they're going through and not just in the library. You know, everyone has a reason and why they seek out the library is wonderful because it is a cooling center. We are a space that allows people to bring in their belongings as long as they're contained. So they feel like a sense of security so that they're not being harassed. And so we also collaborate with the Waffle Police Department. They've been amazing. They, as soon as we call, they come and they have a, li a liaison that helps these individuals and then walks them through the services. The picture on the left, even though we have all these signs that says no trespass, that the police officer mentioned, we still have encampment. And you may see there's laundry hanging up in the, in the trees. So that individual, we um, were able to get them into housing. So that's what I mean is our staff actually goes out, talks to these individuals and does a one-on-one -on -one before they even call anybody in to assist us. So we try to do that, prevent it before it escalates. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yay. Okay, good. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susie Merriam. I'm the Community Development Director here at the city. And I just want to bring you back to our March 
uh, workshop. Uh, can I just get a raise of hands, those of you that were able to join us in March for the workshop? Of course, I want to see all hands raised up here. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So you probably remember uh, what we went through on, on that meeting. We uh, learned about best practices at the federal, state, and county level. We had Helene Sch Schneider from U.S. Interagency Council on um, Homelessness came and spoke to um, the group. We had Robert Ratner that came and, and spoke as well. And uh, we had a couple breakout groups, one where we we tried to get an understanding of, of how homelessness has affected everyone personally in this community. And then we had some breakout groups with some big buckets. And on your screen, you see the big buckets, it's housing, uh, prevention services and resources and management and enforcement. Um, we're really trying to brainstorm ways that we as a city can create a str strategic plan to address homelessness in this city in ways that we can accommodate that that we can afford to do. And uh, today what we want to do is dive down further into that. There we go. I'm, I'm sure you can see this and, and read this very easily on your screen, but that is also why we've had those papers passed out. These are the meeting notes from um, the March meeting and all of the absolutely wonderful ideas um, and potential solutions that the community that was in attendance came up with um, at that meeting. A couple examples, I mean, you can read them. One for housing, more permanent housing, more supportive housing, more housing at all affordability levels, prevention, legal assistance, mediation, keeping people in their homes, uh, rental assistance, services and resources, um, providing more mental health services down here, uh, management and enforcement, connecting, having better connections between PD and, and our service providers in the community. And that's already in the works with um, the police department and CAB as Mish mentioned earlier. Um, so what we wanna do today is further refine these ideas given Tamada's questions. What, we can, what can we do now? What can we do if we don't have any extra funding? What can we do if we can find additional funding in the community? Now, is anyone ready to get up and actually like move a little bit? Because well, yeah, it's 10.08. We've been sitting for at least an hour now. Um, it's going to be our first breakout exercise, and I'm going to give everyone a couple minutes. And in a couple minutes, I don't mean two, I mean three minutes. This is going to be a, a very quick exercise, um, but at least get up. Um, out of your seats. And I think you have sticky notes at each table, sticky notes and pens. And there is an easel straight in the back room, in the in the back corner. We want to know, oh gosh, let's see, did I hit this? No, okay, good. What does solving this homeless problem in our community mean to you? Each one of us might have different ideas or different impacts that we are dealing with every day. For um, the police department or public works, that might mean we're not seeing any more homeless encampments uh, in our sloughs or in our downtown. But, but what does it mean to you? So please take three minutes. Um, write down your thoughts on a sticky note and stick it on the board in the back. And then we're gonna reconvene and go through um, those four buckets and, and do some deeper dives. So hop to it. Thank you, city manager Vives. So as the city manager said, we, let's uh, settle back in. I know we're eager to have a conversation and we will, we're getting there. <laughs> um, I know that council had a few questions. 
Um, I do want to give council a little bit of time to uh, ask those questions, but we didn't really budget that much time for questions. So um, I'm going to cap it at 10 minutes for questions, if that's all right with council. Did any, anyone have questions, council? Okay, so we're going to cap it at 10 minutes um, for questions from council, and then we're going to move forward to our next portion. Uh, council member Montesino, it's a little tricky, but there you go. Hello, hello. It's on? Yeah, there it is. There it is. So just one question from the uh, um, uh, police department about, you know, um, you talked about all the, the um, staff hours and how much we spend. So just, you know, and you highlighted citations. Did we give out any citations? So during the levy cleanup, for an example? Yeah, yeah. No, know, well, that's exactly what, you know, the last cleanup. We took an approach of, like, we de-escalate everything from the moment we show up. So our approach is voluntary compliance. We went out for the levy cleanup on the Friday before the week we started. We went out with Public Works, issued all the notices with Public Works. And then on the Monday when we started, we go out, same thing. If there's people that are still there, we allow them time to pack up. We don't even talk citation. It's just like, hey, you need to leave. It's time to go. You've been given ample time. Um, we didn't have to issue any citations to get anyone to leave. There was no arrests done. We had like a whole, um, what do we call it? Like almost a ladder that we were gonna take if we needed to. We didn't need to take it. Um, we did as we we started down at Sakata, so on the I guess southwest side of the city, and then we moved our way east on the levee towards uh, Lowhead is where we stopped. But um, what we did see is some camps pop back up at Sakata, and during the second week, we did send officers back there to issue citations if the people wouldn't leave, which I believe they issued only two. But there was no arrest that happened down there for illegal camping. We had like one arrest for drug paraphernalia and, and one for like a warrant or something. But otherwise, um, everybody for the most part, it's they understand, right? It's it's time to go. Um, they move on to somewhere else. Um, but we need to clear up this uh, encampment here. We just finished working with Public Works this week down in the slough between uh, like Panda Express and Chevron and uh, Holiday Inn Express. Same thing. There's no arrest, no citations. It's just, it's time to go. Thank you very much. That's my question. Council Member Subsido. Don't go anywhere yet, Captain. <laughs> um, this, question, this question might be better um, for our county partners or perhaps fire might know, but I was wondering about any overdose data for our homeless population. Um, 133 fentanyl deaths this year. I'd like to know what portion of that came from Watsonville and when, then that subsection of were there any homeless related deaths? Are, is our fire going out for Narcan related um, requests? Do we have, is there a way to track that? I believe the answer is yes. Uh, our coroner's <laughs> office can definitely get that data as for, if they do die. Mm -hmm. um, we do track Narcan usage uh, for our city and as well as fire, we have officers, every officer's equipment Narcan, every car is stocked up with it if we need it. Uh, but I know we've used it on the levee, we've used it in the sloughs, we've used it at Salvation Army, um, places where homeless populations congregate. It does happen, but I know we did some tracking earlier this year, I think, Captain. for some homeless deaths that were uh, related to like drug overdoses in the city, right. but I don't have that data available to me. To if it's possible, we maybe we could pull it today. I, um, or I'm not email. sure if I can pull it today. What it's I can okay. do, what I can tell you is that our um, health department, county health department, it's at the levee or in its proximity, doing outreach um, with their health team, and do they do track uh, when they issue Narcan um, kits, and uh, ha may have that some of that data available. So I could request the data and circulate it to the council afterwards. Thank you. And that's it, Captain. Thank you very much. My second question is, um, could somebody explain the different types of vouchers, how long those vouchers are good for, just a brief overview of what the different types of housing vouchers are for when we do these encampments? Ah, thank you. Never mind. 
All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about vouchers and things like that in the next portion. Um, Council Member uh, Parker. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, you know, this, this question is basically for everybody who spoke and talked about budget. Uh, I just kind of wanted to know, I saw what you guys said, uh, how much it costs. And I kind of wanted to get a sense of uh, where it was coming from, where it was coming from, like, outside your budget or if it was part of your budget that you had to use. So we can start with whoever right there, Miss Alicia. I'm yeah. sorry you were chewing. <laughs> so it's an added expenditure. And then public works? We have an ongoing budget for it because that's literally what our field services crew does. But for the speed and the veracity of what we were doing, it definitely pulled us off other things. So that's a long answer. Yes, we have a budget, but does it meet our needs right now? No. Okay. That's a great question. I like to think of our overtime budget as a fictional number um, because it's not somewhat per beat. I know uh, we recently had some data presented. We've spent, in the first three months of the fiscal year, we've spent 62% of our overtime budget. Um, but we do have a large staffing shortage, so that number gets absorbed in those areas. Okay. Uh, I want to ask uh, Works uh, an, uh, just a follow-up on yep. that. You said you have it already budgeted. You have a, you have a, in, we have in a your field budget. Yeah, we have a field services crew budgeted to manage things like this. Like they do a variety of things, one of which is regular homeless encampment cleanups. The number of cleanups has far surpassed what our small crew can do on a day to day basis. So if you weren't, uh, I'm just saying, if that wasn't an issue, and do we, do we as council and as our general budget, do we give you more money because that's a part of it? Or is your department being fully funded for what it needs to do other than this, what you're talking about, that section of it? Oof. Thanks. No, the answer is no. Her department is uh, funded for what the city has traditionally funded for cleanups, which is minimal. And it does not meet the current needs. Okay. So, for example, um, with this current effort, latest effort after um, one of the main issues we had was was uh, not cleaning for a long time, and so then the conditions that we found require extra help, and that was funded. But the long time is re relative, re right? Reprioritize re dollars in the city manager's office yeah. for things that we now cannot do because we prioritize doing the safety uh, uh, cleanup that occurred at the levy. So it is a challenge. We were not budgeted for this level of um, action that we are okay. currently taking. And when you said uh, we haven't cleaned up for a long time, that's a relative statement. What does that mean? How much that is an done? actual statement that for like long time, time meaning five months. Five months. So normally we would clean up three days a week. Three days. Three days a week. Okay. Every single that's week. That's good to know. Okay, right. and then uh, let's move down. Council Member Parker, we only have a couple minutes, a couple more minutes for questions, and I would like uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Well, I love that, but I still haven't taken up as much as the one question that uh, Councilman Eduardo Montesino, who didn't have any questions, took up. We, we, was like coming. I said uh, previously, just we need didn't Mr. have time. Uh, Mr. We didn't budget time. time for questions, so I just want to try to get. I totally hear you. Just think that's with it's really the important. Public. And only one person left. Okay, thank you. Uh, real quick, uh, fire department associated cost estimates were just for staff hours, no overtime. It was a, a dollar value related to those 200 staff hours. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Pro Tem. Can everyone hear me? Oh. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, great. Um, so let me see if I can formulate this question. I got, I was reminded as I was walking through, uh, and say hi to a couple of folks, uh, joining us today is if we were to, uh, take into account the McKinney Vental Act, uh, homelessness definition, how would that impact the statistics that were provided today to council?
Well, that question be for Proverbs County, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but it's something to consider, uh, given that we do have one of the largest districts right here in PBUSD. And it will be interested to see um, how expanding that definition to include specifically that would impact those numbers. That I don't have the answer for your question, but you remind me of a very important point. Uh, I know Robert's here. I, I, I will invite Robert just in a second. But I, I think that's a very good point that you bring um, in terms of uh, PVUSD and the definition of homelessness and what that means and how many homeless students we have in our school district. I believe uh, we heard in the state of the district yesterday morning um, you know, um, a quote about um, homelessness. Ferris, you might be able to help us with that too. Uh, and that's a very important point that I don't want to miss it. And there's an easel that's by the window right behind that camera there. When when we're having this conversation, I don't. I want to. I want to lift that up, and I want to make sure that there are things that are maybe not directly related to the city, but because it's a joint conversation, I want to make sure that those other ideas or those ideas that we need to consider as we're working on actions get captured. So please use your sticky notes and write them down. Ferris, uh, if I may invite you to provide maybe um, some insight on, there's a mic up by the podium. So. Dr. Sabath is with us this morning, at, right on the podium, right next to the laptop. Thank you. Morning. Just Good morning. Good Good morning. morning. Uh, so thank you for the question. Ferris Sabath, County Superintendent of Schools. Uh, Bikini Bento includes uh, people who are doubled up, as, as, uh, as, as you well know. Uh, in the in Pajaro Valley Unified School District, in our last uh, count, there was uh, 2,464 young people, that's K-12, who were identified as homeless under the McKinney-Vento. Uh, the majority of those are doubled up at 2,232, uh, 198 in shelters, uh, 15 unsheltered, and uh, 19 living in hotels, motels. So that significantly increases the count of people who are identified. It's almost under making the bank. And do we know out of the, just really quick, a quick follow-up, out of those 2,040, uh, which are specifically Watsonville residents? Well, those are people in PBUSD. So students who, I would say the majority of the people who are in that category are in Watsonville. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify because PBUSD expands. You know. uh, thank you for that. I would like to share that there is a trend of uh, people who are doubled up, which is decreasing in Watsonville, um, yet the, the number of people who are unsheltered in that category is increasing in Watsonville. Thank you. And the reason why I'm bringing that point up is because while it may not be, I think it is a city issue, it's a community issue. If the majority of these students are unhoused within city limits, I think we, we should be having that conversation. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, with that, my timer is about to go off in about two seconds. All right. <laughs> um, so um, as City Manager Vitas mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, this is an all hands on deck effort. Um, I know that Supervisor Hernandez's office also um, organizes a cleanup all every other month. Um, our, uh, as we've heard, PBUSD is working on these efforts, so this is really all hands on deck to, to try to alleviate this. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and move forward, and we're going to talk a little bit about prevention next. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Carlos Lamoveri. Thank you. Gracias. Oh, that's loud. I'm loud. Move it down. <laughs> and we have now this one is not loud enough. All right. But I'm going to stay on this side, I think. Okay. Thank you. Do I have everything? <clears throat> I've had plenty of coffee. I got some water. And now I get, you get me for five minutes or so. So, Carlos Landaverri, I am the housing manager. Oops. 
goes like this. Yep. What happened? Okay. Thank you all. Thanks for your patience. So in five minutes, what does prevention mean for us as we talk about our people that don't have a roof over their head? But in this terms, I wanna to talk to you about how we keep people housed. We've heard about, and we can finish the sentence, one ounce of prevention is worth a pound of. All right, well, it's, I'm also an interpreter, so I like to translate things. And we do have dollar signs here. So what that really means is that if we take the time and money and we invest about $1,600 per person per year, that translates into saving more than $31,000 in emergency services. And there are studies that show that. Communities that invest in prevention, they spend less and they lesser the impacts of homelessness. Okay, what are we doing here? What kind of prevention efforts are we seeing? And for this, we count on most of our nonprofits because they do the bulk of the work. When we talk about financial assistance, rental assistance, time, money management, education, counseling, our nonprofits are doing the bulk of the work. We have a list of nonprofits here. It's not complete, there are more. But think of an emergency. When you have a single mother that gets kicked out of her house, she's the victim of domestic violence. She has a child. Where does she go in the middle of the night? If she calls someone, sometimes she's got family members, but sometimes they don't. And if we didn't have Pajaro Valley Shelter, and if we didn't have Monarch Services, and if we didn't have, or if she doesn't go to a church, she would be on the street. Sometimes she would have a car, but a lot of times they don't. So we count on our partners so they can do that work. And sometimes just helping one month, if you have, you don't have enough for utilities or to pay the, to cover the rent, for that month, or if you end up going to the doctor, to the hospital, you end up with a big doctor's bill. Next month, you don't have money to pay for food, to pay for gas. What do you do? That's where our nonprofits come in. There's also another risk. If you're renting, you get a huge rent increase or you get an eviction notice. We also count on our nonprofits to provide those services. CRLA, uh, Watch the Law Center, Community Bridges, and the Conflict Resolution Center. They're there to help people, to guide them to the, through the process. They need to file a lawsuit, we do that. And we support all of that. So that's part of the prevention, but what do, what do we do also as a city? We also provide financial assistance. We work with housing authority. We've been working, we have a special program where we incentivize landlords so they can rent to people that they would consider at risk. Usually those, those are low income people that have a housing voucher and landlords used to see them and go, well, that this could be a risk. So we guarantee them that if they rent to a low-income person that has a Section 8 voucher, if they leave that apartment and they damage it, we will reimburse them up to $5,000. And now Housing Authority has matching funds so they can cover a little more. Going back to that person that has to leave her house in the middle of the night, 
or someone that gets an eviction notice and they need to find another place, but they don't have 6,000 or $10,000 for a security deposit for a last month's rent. We have a program like that through Housing Authority. They can help. We have rental assistance. I know CAB is here. If they, you need assistance one month, you have a real emergency, you don't have to cover, you don't have enough money to cover your, your utilities, you can go to them. If you have a plan, you say, look, I'm having an emergency now and I have a plan, I just need assistance, just this much. They can step in. But what if you have, going back to the single mother, she finds an apartment, she gets a security deposit, but now she doesn't have enough to cover the rent. Through housing authority, through families in transition, there is long-term rental assistance up to one year. Families in transition also offers financial and time management and employment um, services. All of that helps and we assist with that. Something more direct to the city, we also provide down payment assistance. And I was looking at our numbers, most of the most, our most recent cases, our most recent homeowners received a down payment assistance because they were being evicted from their apartments. And they came to us for help. And we figured out that they're working, they have a good credit history, they needed some financial assistance. And we gave them enough so they could buy a house. And now they're homeowners. So through our down payment assistance program and first time home buyer program, we have provided over 500 loans. And of course that's all nice, but I'm gonna go back to what Dr. Ratner was saying. We have a young population and we also have a growing senior population. Those two sectors of our community don't make enough to pay for rent and pay for all of the other necessities. They can't make their financial ends meet. So what does that mean? So it means for us, supporting our local employment services, local employers, at the city, we're doing our part. We have a summer program for high school students, police, fire, they have cadet programs, youth opportunities where they can show our young people what careers they can look into, right? Through parks, we have after school programs so that we can have positive activities. The library has the same programs. All of those things are connected to prevention. But we also need to talk about places Nonprofits like Digital Nest that are doing their part so they can get youth in the right path so they can get gainful employment. El Pajaro CDC who works with current and future business owners. Not everyone wants to work for someone else. They wanna be self-employed. We have them. We also have our, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna plug in Cassidy's and McDonald's. They hire high school students. A lot of businesses support their employees so they can go to school. When I worked at a McDonald's, there was an incentive. If you stayed in school and you got an A, we would get $10. You got a B, $5. I made money there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But we also want to know, you are the experts. You're there. One thing I didn't mention is that we have seniors on a fixed income. If you worked your entire life as a minimum wage earner, and the only thing you get is social security, right now you're talking about getting a little over $1,000 a month. We have a senior citizen in one of our mobile home parks that worked her entire life. She was able to buy a mobile home, paid it off in 20 years, 
Now she's retired. She's bringing it home from Social Security about $1,100 a month. Space rent is $575. You have food. You have medication. You have a car, insurance, cell phone. What do you do? We have a lot of those people here. Now imagine this. Now, if you have a senior citizen going to one of your offices, you get sure, right? She goes to the food bank. I need my bag of food. No problem. Imagine having a 22, 25 year old that has a minimum wage job, working 40 hours a week, renting a room. She, he, she shows up to one of your offices and they look very healthy, athletic. And the first thing we say is, why don't they work? And we know that working, having just one job is not enough. So what other opportunities can we explore? Right, we can need to continue partnering with our nonprofits so we can provide more services, specifically free financial workshops. We need to make sure that support is there for our residents in their primary language. Almost 83% of our watchable residents are Latinos. But Latino means, now it means it's everything, right? And so we assume that because we're all Latinos, we all speak Spanish, but we have a lot of people with Mayan languages that we also need to think about them. We need to make sure that people that live and work here in the city have a priority to housing and housing programs. And we need to explore other funding opportunities. I'm a big spender. You give me money, I'll spend it on housing. But it's never enough. So we need to explore how to do that. But now it's your turn. I'm sure you have a lot of ideas and you can help us explore what else we can do. Right, Ms. Jose? Thank you very much, Carlos. That's the wrong way. Let me turn this the right way and hit the right arrow. So when you see me, it means you get to get up and talk and do stuff. <laughs> so we're going to start with another breakout. And this is going to be focused on what Carlos was just talking about, prevention. What are we missing? Um, what is it that you want us to really highlight and consider? And we are again going to go back to um, the sticky notes. We're going to go put them on on the easel in the back. You've got oh, sorry, the paper on the table. So I guess you don't really need to get up, but at least you can talk. <laughs> I know, so close. You can get up and go to the bathroom if you. All want. right, and there are seven yes. tables. So council, let's have one council person at each table. Thank you. So we, we're going to have a council member join one of the seven tables. And you've got about 10 minutes. Woo! It's so simple, so logical, right? Housing is essential for breaking the cycle of homelessness because it provides stability, support for individuals at their different stages of need. And it enables individuals to rebuild their lives and regain independence. But housing is very expensive to build. I don't have to talk to you about that, do I? All right, but let's see. Going back one more. Okay, there it is. So this is the city of Watsonville. We're a small place, less than seven square miles. We have a lot of housing. We are a very dense city. But even with all of those things, we have here over 2,000 affordable units, rental units, that people can pay from as much as 30% of their gross income to a set amount set by the, the owner or the management 
whomever runs the affordable place. We have, within the city, we have senior housing. If you look at the, uh, we have, is this a clicker? Um, does it have lights or not? Ah, oh, the senior villages, close to 900 senior units, ownership units. We have farm worker housing within the city limits. We have mobile home parks, close to 8% mobile homes in the city. Those are affordable by design, but we also have for sale units. And as I said, 2000 units that have been built in the city and it provides affordable rents to our residents. Yeah. All right. Here's what we're doing currently, <clears throat> because that's nice. They're all, they have been built, but we need to build more. This is what we have currently. Right behind Target, we're building for sale units, Hillcrest Estates, Sunshine Gardens. Maybe the most visible projects are the ones right off Freedom Boulevard, right next to Wendy's, Tabasa Gardens. We have Miles Lane, right down Atkinson, Pippin, two, another 80 units. Those are being built by the county, but for all intents and purposes, that project is here in Watsonville. Our people don't know the difference between one street and the other. It's all here. And we have other units being built. What's important is to note that we have, a for, in, that, in there, we have affordable housing, we have market rate rentals, and we have ownership units. All of those projects have either 15 or 20% that have to be affordable to Watsonville residents. But here is, and we have so over 500 units total, over 250 or 100% affordable, either we have rental and for sale, over 300 units or for sale units. That's, and a lot of people tell me, wow, you guys are doing a lot, but look at the new RENA numbers. This is what Watsonville has to build, has to produce in the next eight years, but eight years starting this year. We're at the end of 2024, which means we need to produce over 2,000 units in the next seven years. But if you look at the very first line, we need to build 283 units for very low income folks. Very low income in Watchmill means if you're one person and you, and you make $5,000 a month, that's low income. So that means Dr. Rockner was saying it takes $80 an hour or you can get three, four jobs in order to rent an apartment. How are we going to produce 283 units for people that are working, but they're, uh, they don't make a whole lot? That means we have to partner with our nonprofits, with housing authority, without, without project-based vouchers, that won't be possible. Without working with nonprofits to build affordable units and are committed to renting those units for very low rents, that won't be possible. We need to partner with the county, with housing authority. We need to look for funds from the state, from the federal government all of that in order to get to that point. And when you see a project, when you see an application that supports that type of housing, we need to, need, we need to look at those. And then we need to look at the rest because we have to also provide housing for our workforce, young families, people that wanna buy a house, people that have growing families and need a bigger house, so people that have less people in their family now and they get they need to get a smaller unit we need to provide for all of that all right so through our efforts and the affordable housing ordinance from the city we have built 261 affordable for sale units we have for our seniors that can't don't make enough but they have a house and they can't maintain their unit we have a program to help them remodel or rehab their unit. That's how we keep them housed. And 
We have loans. We have financial assistance for our nonprofit developers. Two examples that I want to highlight are the two projects of Freedom Boulevard, Tabasa Gardens and the one on Miles Lane. The reason, and, and the one on Atkinson is equally structured. Those projects have almost 50% reserved units for farm workers. And we have units there reserved for people experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. In three projects, we will be able to house a lot of families, but we need more of that, right? We give them a little bit of money, we help them build. Here are some of the opportunities. This is where you shine. You can tell us what else we can do. Thank you, Carlos. And on that note, we're going to break out again and do exactly what we did just a few minutes ago. Yay. Okay, so first, we've got the papers at your tables. Uh, regroup. We want to hear what we can do with existing funding, what we can do with no funding, what we can do with extra funding, and then we're going to have you prioritize with the green dots again. And again, if we can be efficient in regrouping after this, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, thank you. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, go ahead, Mayor. We're going to get started with the next presentation with uh, Public Works and Utilities Director Lindbergh. I love the robust conversations hey. that are taking place. Let's continue with our next topic so we can get back into our discussions. Can we get everyone to take their seats, please? We're ready to move on so we can get out of here in time. All right, next we're going to talk about management and enforcement. Yeah. Go to next slide. Okay, so why are we talking about management enforcement? We're taking a big switch from the previous presentation. Uh, to remind you, I'm with Public Works and Utilities, and Captain Mish is with the police. So management and enforcement is, um, it's the it's the not so soft side of, of this issue. Um, so we have active and regular enforcement. It helps to maintain the public open safety like we talked about when we went five months. Boy, we felt it. So we have to be active and maintain these programs in order to keep control. There is no solving this issue 100%, but we can manage and control our city. Uh, so we really want to focus on the protection of critical city infrastructure and environmentally, environmentally protected zones. And for me as public works director, this is critical. This is my commitment to the city. This is my job. And when we have a levy that protects our city, that is like our utmost importance to protect that. Uh, and then also... The reason why we want to do this, we want you to trust us. We're so glad to see you guys came here on a Saturday morning, but if we don't do our job and if we're not transparent about what we're doing, where's the trust and where's the respect with residents? So another reason that we want to show kind of the underbelly of this is because this is what it is. Ignoring this does degrade our city. So this is um, really important with regard to the management. And you can't do management without enforcement. Next slide, please. So some of the areas, This again, this is what we're going to talk about. This is the levy area that we looked at. These are the encampments. These are full-time employees that do that. The environmentally protected areas like we talked about. The levees, the sloughs, and other watershed areas for the city. California has the Clean, you know, Clean Water Act. We face fines. I mean, those are kind of the, 
the economic side of it, but on the environmental degradation side, you know, that's, that's our job as stewards to protect our waterways and our environment. And then encampment cleanups, um, basically saying that we're still committed to these areas, the hot spots that we see, the levees, the slough, the, the panda area, and then working with council for some of the private areas like the Safeway encampment that was not city property to make sure that we're not turning an eye to areas just because they're not city property. Next slide. So for our current police department efforts, just to give you an overview of what, what we can do or where we're helping, with this, um, we recently updated our homeless resource list that we pass out. So anytime we make a homeless contact where we're clearing out an encampment, we do provide them with the resource list. We have them in English and Spanish. Um, <clears throat> as far as if officers carry these with them on uh, patrol, if they do a contact a homeless person during a contact, they can leave that for them. Um, we wanna focus on our problematic homeless population, which we believe to be less than 5%. Our pit number 673, we believe it's less than 5% of that number. That is our actual homeless uh, problematic population, repeat offenders and frequent flyers. These are people that are suffering from mental illness, substance abuse, or both. They're resistive to any type of services or treatment. Um, we work closely with our sheriff's office. They have a focused intervention team that works with county mental health. Um, to get on that list, you have to have one arrest and um, one recent arrest and three police contacts within 90 days. So we have our parts of our po uh, problematic homeless population that are on that list. If they get contacted, arrested, there's reserved space in the jail where they get held until they go to court. But the focus is to force them into services and mental health has extra time to work with them while they're in custody. Next slide. This was sent out by our city manager's office, but it's a business toolkit. Uh, the police department was uh, involved with sending this out. Some of our businesses, what they don't know is they, they see frequent um, homeless population, whether it be theft, loitering, or just disturbing their business. A lot of times what happens is the business owner isn't there to see this. So they're getting reports from employees. Hey, we called the police, but they didn't do anything. Um, part of it's educating the employees on, hey, when I'm not here, you're my agent, right? That's what it, what's listed as in the penal code. When the officer asks you, what do you want done? You need to tell them the, the business wants this person removed. We want the person arrested if they don't leave. We want the person arrested if they come back. That way the officer knows a lot of this stuff is a misdemeanor that's not committing our, in our presence where we can't make an arrest. We need that from the agent from the employee, whoever is calling us. Sometimes they're like, I don't know. My boss just said when they're here, call. And a lot of times it's the same person at the same business over and over and over again. So we've done our side on to telling the officer, hey, inform the person, hey, well, I can't arrest the person unless you tell me you want them arrested. And then the light bulb goes on. Next slide. So some of the opportunities that we see and want to present to you and kind of plant the seed is, uh, you know, creating a streamlined PD in-house process for issue. That one. So one thing we're looking to do is to, uh, we tell a lot of property owners or business owners, get a no trespass letter on file with us. It's a little bit harder to do now in California, but uh, it requires the, the letter to be notarized. So what we're going to do is we're going to kick off an in-house program where you can come to our records uh, department when they're open. They're open Monday through Thursday from eight to four. You go in on site, you can fill out that letter. We'll have a notary on the other side of the window that notarizes it, and then it goes in the system. That way, when officers go to these calls, they know, hey, there's a valid trespass letter on file. I don't need the owner to be there when I deal with it. If the person's there, I already know I can arrest them if I need to, if they refuse to leave. We don't need someone to tell us, hey, they can't be here. It's already known. Um, I guess it's kind of a, yeah, I was going to say the rest of the. Yeah. <laughs> we practiced this a bunch of times. Uh, it's exploring funding opportunities. I think one of the areas that makes Watsonville so unique is our geographic proximity with the counties and with the river. So that presents a lot of partners for uh, additional funding opportunities, something we want to look at. 
one of the things, um, I, an idea I had was creating like a proactive community-based homeless task force and comprised of some city staff, some council members, and then of course residents so that we're not only talking about this once every three, four months when we have these formal kind of curated workshops, but just having more dialogue. And then other things that we are doing, we're exploring additional ordinances such as oversized vehicle parking, which is a slippery slope into the RVs and huge uh, vehicles that we see that people live in, uh, revamping our illegal camping ordinance, and then establishing distance parameters from waterways to prevent further uh, degradation that I talked about before. Back to Susie. Let's go. Guess what, everyone? We're gonna do what we did just a few minutes ago. You've got your new sheet of paper in front of you and 10 whole minutes. So please brainstorm on what we can do, opportunities for management and enforcement. Once you've got all your ideas on your sticky notes, please take your green dots and prioritize those and then we'll keep moving on. So thank you. All right, here we go. Up next, we are going to be talking about enforcement. All righty, welcome back. And so this is the last breakout session. So this is one of my favorites. So what services and resources are we providing? Why, what are we currently doing? And what opportunities? So why services and resources? They're essential for addressing homelessness since they provide crucial support, including mental health care, job training, and substance abuse treatment programs, which help individuals regain stability and independence. As we know through the National Alliance to End Homelessness, they report that supportive services can reduce the risk of returning to homelessness by 80%, and communities that implement comprehensive support services see a decline by 30% in homelessness over time. So this is a better approach to foster, better relationships within our community, and we will create long-term solutions that benefit everyone. With that being said, our Watsonville Police Department is also working on such current efforts. Hello again. So our, our city, we just kicked this off and Community Action Board is here and thank you for being part of this. Um, they just hired the person this week and then she should be on the street. <laughs> she should be on the street with our PSS who's here today, uh, Jose Navarro, he's kind of worked in your groups. They should be on the street, um, not the week of the 7th, but the week of the 14th. So you should see them out there. That's a different approach that we're taking that I kind of talked about earlier, but we'll have a, uh, a representative of the police department out there with a service provider that that's able to talk, has time to just narrow down what the issue is with a certain person, why they're on the street. Is it that they can't find a job um, is it that they're addicted to drugs? Is it a mental illness thing? And they can guide them to different types of services. Um, they'll also work closely with our care team, for example, if it's a mental health issue, but it's a different approach that we're taking um, on homelessness to just kind of narrow down and focus and get people connected to uh, different types of services. If there's, if, there, if there's shelter space available, if the person's a veteran, they need veteran services, they have the ability to, if that person wants to go with them and they make uh, pre-arrangements on the other side of it, that they're ready for an intake, they can transport that person um, to those services. Um, they'll also have that ability. Um, and they'll be out there on weekdays, five days a week. Um, our, <clears throat> our care program that we've had since 2016, it's called Crisis Assessment, Assessment Response and Engagement. We partner with County Mental Health. We have an in-house Mental health liaison that works with us, who's a clinician, Raina Valencia. Um, she's out there dealing with these people with their officers often. Um, a lot of times though, certain people, they don't meet the criteria 
necessarily where they need to go on a 5150 hold. So it's just guiding them towards mental health services that the county has to offer. And then finally, one, one thing we have is the current prevention effort or service available is we have a multidisciplinary team where we partner with uh, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, Community Action Board, and Monarch Services. Everybody has their own situation, right? And some of these people that are homeless or experiencing homelessness, they might have had a traumatic situation um, happen early on in their life that's controlling their life now that hasn't been dealt with. So on the front end, what we're trying to do is get to these people sooner before it, it's a domino effect where they have one incident in their life that just kind of takes over their life later. So that's another uh, program we have at the police department. And the library, considering we're in downtown and we're a hub, um, that's the first place people tend to come for information. So we feel that the library is a vital resource to our community because we are on the front line. We see a lot of these individuals coming in who need the support, who ask us, where can I go shower? Where can I go shelter? Where can I get food? And so we always have um, every second Tuesday of the month, just so you know, we have partnered with a lot of local agencies who come into our library to offer these services. The homeless population, veterans, uh, behavioral health is there, community action board, and also those that are experiencing a hospice. And then we have the p individuals coming in giving financial information to parents for the Semillitas program and for the uh, other program through the California Education. We are also being trained to refer individuals to other service providers, and we offer on our library website an extensive list of local community resources and nonprofit organizations in Santa Cruz County. So we vetted these organizations, and so we always call ahead to let this organization know that we are sending this individual so that they don't show up and then they don't receive any services. With that, these are opportunities to enhance services and resources. And so these will be on your table, but I just wanted to highlight a few. You know, do we create a low barrier navigation center with wraparound service that keeps people housed and connected to services they need? Explore the feasibility of a resource center at our public libraries, right? A one-stop place where some of these organizations have drop-in hours. So these are some of the ideas. Um, and then continue to support and, collab and collaborate with our nonprofit organizations like the California Rural Legal Assistance, Placido Legal Center. So continue with our existing partnerships, but how do we continue to leverage and collaborate? So with that being said, are you ready? We're gonna break out again. <laughs> so you have 10 minutes. And this is where I think we would like to really, really from you input on how we can then really provide some of these resources and services. So you have 10 minutes. May, may, I, may I please um, provide a little bit more expectation and maybe, maybe with, that, with that increased expectation, we increase your time. Uh, just, just because I see that the board that's um, by the window, a, a little bit lonely and not many ideas have been plastered there. Again, this is, this is the area of all the areas we're diving into where the city can rely more on partners. So I, don't, I want your brainstorming to also include, the city might not be able to do that because they're not funded for it, they're not staffed for it, that's not a city department, but we would like to see more of our partner, uh, county partners to help, or some, some of the faith-based community partners can, can provide a service or a resource. Please do not be shy with those pen. Grab a sticky note and put it there. Because again, if we go back to the expectation at the beginning, this is a collective we, right? And this is an area of all the themes that we've been discussing this morning where we have more collective impact. So I wanna encourage you to think about if it's not the city who could do these, but somebody else could, make sure you put it over there. 
so we can capture it. Other ideas we can leverage. Don't forget, leveraging is very powerful. Or, um, be w being willing to engage in uh, in the process in uh, prioritizing. I could observe uh, as I was quickly typing the notes that you guys got very creative about how to vote towards the end. So now you're grouping post-its and I'm like, which one is a priority? And, and I want to acknowledge that because it's hard. What we're doing together is hard work. And the more creative you got, the harder you made it for a summary to be prepared. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's what we're working towards. So I, I just want to um, acknowledge that we need a little bit of time to really, really process everything that you gave us this morning. So thank you, because there's a lot. Um, our team here has been furiously typing uh, notes to be able to uh, provide a summary and allow for the next few minutes together this afternoon. Uh, we we scheduled this meeting until one o'clock, so it's going to be for you, Mayor, to um, converse with your council. And what what we're hoping to obtain, the staff here is hoping to hear council direction with feedback provided. How do we move from here? What are your top priorities? What next time that we talk about this topic, and for the community to know, next time that we that we talk about homeless action plan. We want to have some sort of idea of like, these are the things that we're working on. We want to know how we are investing, if we need to reprioritize dollars, if we need to reassign staff, if we need to re-engage or engage differently with partners. So you are going to be able to see uh, some of those opportunities in front of us uh, right now. Uh, in the master's presentation, um, I captured some notes. So, Mayor, if I may, I like to recap uh, the feedback that was provided on prevention, and maybe we spend a few minutes, continue giving the team um, an opportunity to type. Mm -hmm. okay. So that we can that we can collect that feedback. Do you, do you have the PowerPoint where I add it? So I want to I want to begin by acknowledging what is uh, solving the problem mean, and I I did not rehearse this because this is your feedback, and these are the top ideas that came up about this morning's discussion about what does it mean solving the problem. So Suriel is working live here on the PowerPoint. If the computer works with us, we'll see it. Okay. So in this room, we talked about affordable and low barrier housing focusing on more long-term affordable housing options for unhoused individuals and fewer barriers to entry. That is um, what it means to many in this room, and that's why this is here. Dignity and respect is important, treating the unhoused with dignity and respect while providing them with opportunities to transition into stable housing. Comprehensive supportive services, making sure that we offer mental health services, drug addiction treatment, and support services as a first step towards housing stability. Community well being was mentioned, building a healthy, inclusive, and safe environment for all, including prioritizing farm workers and vulnerable populations. Uh, an emphasis in uh, what does it mean solving the problem is, again, something I've been highlighting since we started this morning, collaboration and coordination, encouraging more cooperation between local organizations and nonprofits. So again, it's for all of us. Equity and prevention, um, ensuring equitable distribution of resources, focusing on prevention and advocating for policies to reduce homeless and uh, at the systemic level. There are others say like we want to save designated spaces, establishing designated areas, necessary facilities for the unhoused individuals while considering the needs of homeowners and other community members, awareness and education, rising public um, awareness through education on best practices for solving homelessness and promoting empathy. 
And last but not least, a holistic approach of creating a safer community through a comprehensive plan and addressing root causes of prevention and recovery while balancing the needs of residents. So that is in a short summary of about 10 very important That is us, that is us in this room. That is how we collectively come together and expect to solve homelessness problem in our community. There is a lot to um, to take in, right? So again, today is about building an action plan. So let's go to the next layer. Can I, if I click, I will see the next layer, Sudian? <laughs> okay, so Mayor, I'm gonna, um, soon pass the mic to you. I just want to kind of, um, these are not in order. Again, we're working live, but I don't want anybody that works so hard to go home and say like, what did we say? This is what we said, right? This is it's terrible to speak in front of the computer. Uh, this is uh, some of the things that we can do differently. So these are, and, uh, and uh, council, I want you to like l take this in and then because I'm going to be looking for you to provide us direction. There's a lot of interest in rent control ordinance. There's interest in more job trainings, expanding the definition of the unhouse was mentioned. Um, and is if you can see if I have a number in parentheses at the end, it means um, you know those things that were um, very prioritized. Uh, using uh, best practices and data to ensure funding uh, is actually preventing families from becoming homeless. And then there's there's a list of other, so if they're showing up, I wanna say this is a not, not an inclusive list. These are those that you put a dot to it. So there's a lot more that we don't have time to type live because you wrote a lot of ideas. So I'm not implying that this is a, a, a full list, but this is the one that you prioritize in your groups for from all groups, right? So that's what uh, some ideas that we can do differently. Um, I just really want to call this out. What can we do differently without additional funding? And you know what? Prevention is effective and is cheaper, but not much can be done if we have not funding. And I'm not saying that. You said that. We said that as a group, right? There's nothing we can do if we don't have dollars to invest in this very um, area. So I, I wanted to call that out uh, because there are ideas if we have additional funding, you know, supported services, uh, vouchers, building more in low income housing, rental assistance programs, and on and on. There is a list of ideas there. So, Mayor, I'll pass it on to you for discussion on this one topic as we continue. And then we're going to kind of go over the four buckets for direction. Thank you, City Manager Vivas. Um, do we have comments from Council? That's a first. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Parker. Um, I heard, heard a lot of great things uh, out there when I was walking around and participating, as well as um, from uh, uh, our uh, our city manager. And um, I, I do have to say that, that that was one of my, that's one of my major observations. City of Watsonville doesn't even have as big a budget as the Faro Valley Unified School District. And money makes the world go round on this. And um, uh, Councilwoman um, Maria Rasco uh, brought up a good point. And as a teacher, I feel very strongly about that, that if we have monies to put towards something, partnering with the Paro Valley Unified School District and focusing on homeless children and families in our city is huge. And, and as a priority, and because it seems to me that um, unless somebody's going to hand us 20 to 40 million or answer our pleas when we put in for grants and matching monies, 
um, that we can't do things for the, the broader uh, group, but we can do it for our families and we can do it for our children in our community. And that would be something that if we have to allocate for, that I would be in great favor of doing and focusing on for our future in this discussion. Thank you, Council Member Parker. Other comments from Council? Council Member Salcido? With the first group that I spoke with, we had a great conversation around um, housing and rental increase ordinances. Um, I would really like to see if there's something more that the city can do in that space um, regarding what we ha actually have on the books, our current laws. Are there any um, other ordinances we can do for rent control? And then enforcement. Um, how are we getting notified if um, the rentals are having uh, price increases that are above um, what we um, require, right? Um, so are they required to notify us what their yearly increase is? Um, or do we have to wait till tenants complain in order to obtain that information? So in what way are we regulating um, uh, rent control and how are we getting the information from the landlords? And that would be the only thing as to um, prevention that I was really interested in. Thank you. Other comments from council? Mayor, I'm sure I would like to echo what um, Council Member Ari Parker mentioned. I think it is critical that we uh, continue to have the conversation and explore areas of collaboration with PBUSD when addressing homelessness and youth and families within um, <clears throat> the city. But the other thing uh, that sort of was reinforced um, to me uh, through today's meeting is just how much we have to rely on one another and how much partnership plays into ensuring that we accurately and most effectively are able to address uh, this very complex issue within our community. Um, one of the things that I would personally like to see, I know it's a pilot program, but I would really want to explore the option of of expanding the pilot program is it through pSSS I always forget the name of the connector the navigator program yeah uh because I think that's going to be it was going to play a critical role in ensuring that when we uh connect with a person uh, experiencing homelessness that we are able to right from the get-go identify what the issue is and connect that person, that individual with the resources that they need. Um, so that's an area I think that it's um, worth exploring. Um, I know this is probably one conversation out of many more that we will be having, but just like what we did with our general plan, my hope is that we can develop some solid goals based on the feedback that we're receiving develop a strategic plan with benchmarks. Um, and if funding needs to be secured from being proactive and uh, creative and in ways to, to bring that additional resources needed to address this issue. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Dutra. Hello. Okay. Um, so I guess a couple things I wanted to, uh, to talk about. One is, and I've been saying, I've been, I talk about it for years, is that we need to address the uh, mental health and addiction part of this. Um, and I think we get to discuss on the housing portion of it, of it when, um, I mean, it was kind of clear today with, uh, we were told that PVSS was down to one bed and that they had a certain amount of spaces available and none of the women wanted to take advantage of that. So um, I think that um, we, you know, we have to address separate. We can't just say that the unhoused population, um, that housing 
to address it. I think we need to encompass everything, and that includes the addiction uh, and mental health portion of it. Uh, so um, I know that we don't really have the funding for all this, but um, we need to. I think that's where we need as well. And I do agree that prevention is um, is key here because. I remember when I got on the council a decade ago, and we were dealing with a lot of um, a lot of gang issues. And um, what we what we started dealing what we started doing was prevent putting a lot of money into prevention, PAL after school programs, programming programmings um, in general for all the kids. And we've really seen um, a change in that. We see a much safer community. Um, we see. Um, people, you know, not getting into the, the trouble that we would have seen in the past because we were investing into our future through prevention. And I think that prevention could, if we do that with, with the population, I think we could really see a, um, a, a difference in the future. So um, whatever that may look like, uh, I, I think we definitely need to figure that out. But I do believe that we have seen through different models and approaches in other areas of our city that prevention does work. So um, I think that's the route we really need to go. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Council member Montesino? Turn it on, Ron. Um, you know, I, ju I just want to, you know, acknowledge it. It, 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 it is going to take, you know, all of us working together and really, you know, I, I think, you know, we did see what we're kind of doing, but I don't think we bear the bones of what we're not doing. Um, um, one of the things, you know, we have, a, a, we have, you know, a, to our north, um, we have a city of Santa Cruz doing a lot of efforts in this, uh, in this uh, house effort, and they've been really successful getting, you know, a, a grant opportunities and all that. What are they doing? We ha we got to figure out what they're doing and 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 if it's a priority for us, and it's and if it's, it is a priority for us, then we got to educate the community because I represent the 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 um, uh, part of the downtown, and I tell you there's segments in our in, in, in that I represent that that are just dealing with as you saw some of the some of the pictures outlined they're dealing with you know the few five percenters. And they're really harsh conversations, you know. So how do we, you know, educate, you know, that part of the community or just everyone in the community that this is this is this is an issue for all of us, not just a few of us. And you know, I, you know, um, we need to educate the community that you know we need to take care of each other and need to take care of just the holistic community because in, in order to grow as a community, we do, we do need to, you know, uh, get there. And um, I like to see, you know, what, you know, I saw a lot of nonprofit a agency here, but, uh, but I, I, you know, we didn't give them an opportunity. I like to see what they're doing and what the future looks like for them. What are you, what, you know, you know, whether it's a school district, whether it's a health trust fund, whether it's a community, um, endeavor. So how can we, you know, work creatively and see what everybody's doing? Are we do it? Are, are we both doing the same things? You know, are we, you know, so what gaps are we not filling in or what, or what can we work together to do better? That's what I, you know, um, because in those endeavors are the ones that we're going to see and my belief, we're going to see change. Um, and because absent that, we're 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 looking at. I was just talking to the table. We're look and silos. Everybody's doing their own thing here, here, here. Uh, okay, like, but where are we? You know, the county's doing their thing. You know, the count. Uh, uh, you know, the cities are doing one thing. The the nonprofits are doing other things. But holistically, what are, what are we all doing? And and how can we achieve a better outcome? You know. So that, like I said, uh, I hopefully in the future we can get, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, um, whether it's in a presentation or, or you guys come to council or you guys, or we have another session to see what, what, what areas are you, are, are you working on and what is your boards or, or, or thoughts in the future are, are, are what are you doing? You know, cause like I said, I, I just, I see what we, we, we're, we're kind of doing. 
but I don't see the, the uh, I I didn't see from a staff perspective what we're not doing, what we could do, what we could do. And that's what we need to, you know, work on. Like, you know, um, Councilmember Rosco mentioned, you know, working with the school district, great, you know. Oh, can we work with, you know, can we work with anybody else to see, the, you know, the those barriers come down for housing, um, you know, uh, you know, ordinances or, you know, or, or just look at, you know, um, areas of opportunity for housing. Why don't we, because that, you know, we're all talk about on house where we, you know, we have all these projects, but where are gaps of opportunities? Do we have any infill that we need to, uh, uh, that we need to work on? You know, so, you know, we did the downtown specific plan. Uh, are we, are we, are we pushing the, uh, you know, developers or pushing, you know, uh, the business committee to, you know, to gain, you know, put some, uh, you know, resources on the ground. So, like I said, just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Um, I think it's also important to um, to follow up on what Council Member Montesino said that we're not working in silos and we're not duplicating our efforts in areas that are already being worked on. So I think super super important. Um, I think one thing that stood out to me is the just how much we need to focus on prevention with students. It really um, was difficult to hear how many students are unhoused, how many young people. That's that's really challenging. I can't even imagine. I have had students that um, had unstable housing situations, and they always managed to do their homework and come to school. Um, and I think we definitely need to support those students because that must be so challenging. Um, <clears throat> And then one thing I did want to mention is I took a look at the board that had other ideas that didn't quite fit into um, the categories. And I saw a post-it that said, um, there's a lot of people willing to help and we're waiting for a call to action. This is a call to action. <laughs> this is it. We're doing it. Um, so thank you for being here. And I think collaboration is key. That's really one of the biggest takeaways is that this is a really multifaceted issue that takes a lot of um collaboration community support um and as i said in the beginning just an all hands on deck effort all right with that if we don't have any other comments from council i'm going to turn it back to um city manager Vivas. no last comments all right take it away all right so now that we have had um some time to breathe and type really fast thank you team thank you everyone that's helping <laughs> type I, I can go through the last three buckets and then you can wrap up um, with great discussion. And again, we want to hear um, what happened. Was a different one? <coughs> or refreshing? Okay. That's your department. <laughs> refreshing is Suriel's department. So in the housing, in the housing department, we uh, we ask you to kind of provide feedback about same same three ideas. What can we do differently? So um, rent control shows here too. There, these are not in a specific order, but um, just want to call like there are about six votes that uh, kind of point at cultivating a local affordable housing development agency that is focused on developing affordable housing. There's um, ideas about um, I think one that also received a lot of support and votes was a city to pursue a state pro housing designation. And, uh, you know, Mary sitting conveniently next to me, I asked her, what does that mean? And how do we do that? And, you know, quickly, like, Watsamo is not a, a pro housing, um, doesn't have a pro housing designation um, from the state. So that's a real, very realistic opportunity that kind of showed up from input that um, now I understand we we could uh, explore if that was the interest of the council. Um, other ideas uh, in in terms of what we can do differently, uh, we have um, good good a good list of things that we can do without additional funding. And again, it's it's just working working in partnerships and um, supporting development of uh, land developers to create more housing opportunities in Watsumo. 
and um, encouraging uh, the city to build more flexible ADU, um, streamlining the, the building process for those. Um, so those are some ideas that rose to the top on without additional funding. And there are some ideas about funding that I will have to need. I need to spend a little bit more time to kind of see in what context these ideas were coming up because uh, and if you have, if you wrote the, any of these bullets, please don't leave the room without telling me more context because it's really, it's really hard. Uh, you know, right now I'm not sure. Like, do we pursue funding for a nonprofit, or I'm not sure what some of this means. But you all know who I am, and if you if you have these, please please make sure you connect so that we can put this more into context. In terms of management, again, tons of opportunities of things that we can do differently, education, uh, incentives instead of tickets, incentives to, I would imagine, to be rehoused or uh, connect with services. Um, there's an idea of, um, you know, developing a homeless coordinator, expanding partnership with nonprofits, um, safe parking places. Uh, that is something that I know is the person from AFC here today. No, I know there's there's something that um, the county is supporting in our city that that will build safe parking programs. So that's something that's in the works. Definitely something we can do differently. Applying for more funding is something we can do, as uh, Councilmember Montesino mentioned. Like, what are we doing that we're not applying for funding? So making sure that we're Additional funding, updating city ordinances is something we can do without funding. And uh, there are some ideas and Mary is available to also answer some of those questions for the council about a myriad of uh, ordinances or things other cities are doing in terms of uh, not only managing, but also incentivizing housing, um, um, don't criminalize, uh, mobile kitchens and showers, you know, just this really um, is speaking um, very much uh, in the area of services. Uh, it's bleeding into services more than than enforcement. So I want to acknowledge that. And, and uh, once we have a little bit more time, we'll definitely put the ideas more in the bucket um, where they could be more actionable. Um, and then uh, this is, if we had additional funding, these are some ideas that came up. Last bucket, um, if we can do differently, um, partner with the county for a warming center, that's something we did last, last um, winter we did that. Um, and um, definitely we, we continue to always have conversations with our county partners about what we can do during winter time. Um, partnering with CBOs, aligning navigation and prevention, education of homelessness individuals. I'm just kind of reading some highlights that um, are on the screen. The, I, no thank you yet. <laughs> um, what we can do if we had additional funding there's a, an idea of restoring the shelter, training or hiring people with experience in workforce, building and funding resources with wraparound services seems to come up was again as a as an area of interest. And I again, like I guess, like I said, when uh, when I invited you to use the board in the back, there's a lot in this bucket that will be. Um, for all of us to lift up together. So I just wanna, again, acknowledge that. And um, and um, yeah, so those are, that's the feedback on all our four um, breakout sessions that we had this morning. I know it's a lot. I'm not expecting the council to have memorized them, but, but, but I do, will, I would invite the council to provide staff, like what are the areas that are coming up for you that you want us to kind of explore deeper? and uh, in more detail before we come back to you. Mayor.
All right. I think with that, we are ready to adjourn. Are we at our adjournment? Comments? Yeah, could, <laughs> yeah, could we could we get that um copy of that? You want it right now? We can print we can print out the, the when, word document if you like. Um council? It will take email. Uh, Council Member Parker. Um, I feel kind of rushed on this, but the only thing I can think of that I think we'd all agree on right now is funding, looking and, and being more aggressive um, or, uh, you know, in any way, shape or form, uh, looking at funding from the state so that, that the city gets to decide, we're not imposed upon in any other way, we get to decide our priorities, our, uh, the people from the city of Watsonville get to decide the priorities of how we wanna spend this for our houseless community. I just think that's, the, right, funding. Absolutely. Council Member Montesino, did you have a comment? I think, I think, you know, holistically, yes, the funding, but we got to figure out what we're asking for um, before we, well, yeah, but the state doesn't just give you money, say here, Watsonville, do as you want. We got to have a, we have a, have to have a, a plan. plan. <laughs> uh, you have to have a plan of what you're requesting for. And I don't think we're there yet. You know, um, there's a lot of great ideas uh, that we, we have to turn over. I, I you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and go like, oh, yeah, one, two, three, you know, um, uh, because there's uh, a lot of things that we we got to got to think about. Um, but, you know, overall, you know, thank you for for giving that that feedback. And and, you know, I, I certainly go out to I know my community and, uh, you know, as I'm walking, you know, uh, um, uh, the election, you know, to, uh, to talk about these instances. And like I said, they have other ideas. You know, very different ideas of how, how how we should be be doing stuff. So, like I said, uh, um, at this time, I, I you know um, I wouldn't be able to you know prioritize you know uh, all these great ideas. But thank you. I think one thing that um, jumped out to me personally um, was the idea for a critical unit for case management for that five percent of um, folks that refuse services that are constantly called um, again and again. So that might be a place where we could start to advocate for funding to have, you know, some kind of resources, um, because if if that 5% of people are taking up all the resources, we should maybe have some funding dedicated to that. So um, I really like that idea of the critical case management unit. Um, I think that is a really, really good idea. So kudos to whoever came up with that, because I thought that's a good place to start. Um, <clears throat> some other things that stood out to me, it sounds like, excuse me, it sounds like a lot of us are interested in looking at rent control ordinance. Um, we already talked about advocacy for um, state and federal funding, mixed zoning, um, transitional housing, uh, wraparound services navigation center, um, and a homeless coordinator. So those were some of the things that stood out to me. I don't know if council has any ideas, any other ideas on things that stood out to them or places that we might start. I know it was a lot to process and I heard a lot of great ideas. So thank you for the robust discussion. Other comments, council member Parker? Yeah, I probably didn't make myself clear. I mean, I understood what Councilman uh, Montesino was talking about, which is if you're asking for funding, what are we asking for funding for? Um, I'm not prepared for that right now. I think it's too broad, uh, too many things to talk about. And if we're going to prioritize it, then, you know, uh, I said funding because it's the most general and the most needed. Without funding, we can wish all we want, but it's funding that's going to make any of these programs, anything move forward. So I'm I'm not in favor of giving staff a huge amount of direction other than funding <laughs> in any way possible. Um, and then and then having more time to process it and prioritize it and have these discussions uh, amongst ourselves. 
Absolutely. I think the idea was to get us to look at the feedback from the public and sort of go from the public, what the public had proposed um, and go from there and begin to think about it when we come back to our, our next meeting. So I don't think any of us is prepared to give ultimate direction right now, but we do want to take that feedback from the public um, and incorporate it into um, our uh, our strategic plan for mayor. And, and I do have a question about that because the public is, uh, in, and I appreciate everybody who showed up today, but I don't know who this public is in a lot of ways. Some of them uh, live in the city of Watsonville. Some of them do not. Some of them work in the city of Watsonville. Some of them do not. Uh, and so, you know, for me, this conversation is like, this is our second conversation that we've had as a group that it's barely started with the community of Watsonville, the people who live here. And that's where the priority kind of discussion as uh, Eduardo Montesino just finished saying, I go back to my district, I go back, he's going to go back to his, talk to people and find out, you know, and, and get them a little bit more involved in what this plan is that we're looking at and that we're focused in on the city of Watsonville, because we are very limited with funding. I'm going to say it again, because that's the biggest part of it and where we want to start as a city, um, you know, uh, where we're going to go forward. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And that was the purpose of today's meeting. So. That's why we're here. That's why we're having these conversations. I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Bevis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple of uh, areas I, I want to make sure that um, I, 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 not just for the council, but also for the public who help us today. Um, I think it's important that that we recognize that we have a second meeting. We we I will lead the charge in processing the notes, making those available. Make sure you leave your email. There's a signing sheet floating in the room. If you leave us your email, we can share that. It will also be agendized in a public meeting just of the council. So just make sure that that um, you know you follow that agenda in the future because that information will be made available. So I just want to be very transparent about the feedback that was collected, uh, and we will have to prioritize. I, I I agree with everything that you're all saying, but I want to also remind us that not only is collective, but we also had a ton of discussion and prioritization of things that we can do without funding. So I don't want to like you know drown by the fact that we don't have enough. Raise your hand if we think we have enough no hands will go up. We don't have enough. It, funding, fighting for funding and advocating for funding is, is a work that we have to do. Uh, it's ahead of us. And, and definitely, you know, the better and more clear priorities that we have as, as, as a collective, the, better, the easier it will be. But we can do a lot without funding. And I will uh, want to propose to the council that, that we, we, we start there and we, we start looking at some of those opportunities. I also don't want to miss out, Mayor, if I may, uh, the opportunity. We have Mary Wagner with us um, here today, and uh, she brings um, a great deal of expertise in um, policy and uh, particularly in the area of homelessness. So because we don't have her at every council meeting, if the council had any questions about ordinances or policies, I I would um, want to encourage you to, you know, uh, allow Mary to maybe provide some ideas and see if you're interested in diving into some some of that. And uh, that's entirely up to you. So I'll put it back to you, Mayor. All right. <clears throat> Council, did you have any? Yes. Uh, count, uh, excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I know I've been in conversation with Car Carlos and our city manager and Susie on our city's affordable housing ordinance and you know some changes that we could potentially uh look to to do and a big part of that is local preference so adding language within that ordinance um to ensure that we get preference to families and individuals who live and work in the city of watson bell so I'm wondering if, if, legally speaking, is there anything that would prevent us from doing that? Uh, 
Thank you. Um, that's definitely something we can look into further for you. Local preferences can be tricky um, in terms of some of the legal constraints around uh, uh, using governmental funds solely for people who live in your community, but we can we can definitely look into that. You know, a lot of jurisdictions focused on things like providing um, police officer and teacher housing. And so I think it's somewhat similar to focus on your own community, but it is definitely something we could look into further for you. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's important as we, you know, try to address homelessness here in, in, in Watsonville is having that local preference. So whatever we can do legally, uh, I think would be an area that I would love to continue to explore. Um, and if there is a way for us to do that, that's something that I will want to bring back to council for approval. Council member Parker. Yeah, thank you, Maria, for bringing that up because that's probably one of the biggest, we all agree on that. And that's one of the biggest um, impediments that we've seemed to have been placed in front of us. Uh, and so I have the question with the thought that we have been told up to this point that if we don't fund it completely ourselves and we don't build it, then we have no control over who lives in it. And um, and so uh, understanding that if we don't fund it completely ourselves, it doesn't come from our city monies. Um, is there any other way? To increase a percentage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, so that because that's that is the biggest and main point we have been told over and over and over again uh, for every single when we wanted to increase our low income housing um, as well. So thank you for looking into that more deeply and giving us some definitive answers moving forward. Um, and inside that if we can is there a um a standard of who lives here so when how long do you have to live here to qualify you know what does it make you immediately just because you're in the vicinity um you move in two days uh, and now you'd qualify does it is it a 30 day is it one year is there anything out there that says anything about that if we wanted to build this. Thank you. Other questions? Council Member Montesino. So um, uh, rent control, what kind of ordinances, you know, are, are there out there in rent control? Or or, or uh, a piece of it is how, how we, you know, because our community has, has, you know, quadruple, you know, within a very short period of time. You know, uh, now our houses are averaging about 800,000, which is crazy. My house is not worth 800,000, believe me. You know, I live in it, you know, um, but it, it's, it's, so it's crazy. But, uh, um, but like, you know, people that are renting the, the, you know, people are, are you know, uh, getting eviction notices. People are getting, you know, are, are the, you know, um, are getting increases 20%. So is there a way cities are, are dealing with that, you know? I like, you know, so yeah, uh, thank, thank you for that question. And it's a really good one. A lot of jurisdictions are looking into rent control ordinances, which are also coupled with just cause eviction um, uh, restrictions. So that while rent control, you know, may put a percentage increase on the amount that rents can increase annually, that it, that I've seen those also coupled with what's called just cause eviction which you can't evict someone except for certain um, designated reasons. And if you do, and it's not one of those reasons, you may have to provide um, assistance with relocating or other provisions. I will tell you in my own community, the council adopted a, a rent control ordinance and a just cause eviction ordinance that was then put on a referendum and it's on the ballot um, for the, the community to consider. I think the community is mostly not not as much concerned about the rent control portion of it, given the percentages that are based into the ordinance, but more on um, a landlord's ability to control who lives in their um, their property and for how long. 
so it, it's definitely not without you know some um, both sides of the coin, if you will. Councilmember Salcid. I'm just following up on that question. Are you aware of any ordinances that mandate reporting of uh, landlords for their rent increases? How are cities aware of how much all of the different landlords in our community are up, up, um, increasing their rent yearly? Yeah, I made note of that when you brought it up, and it's not something I can answer for you off the top of my head, but something we can definitely bring back um, examples of what other jurisdictions have done to ensure, you know, whether it's proactive or reactive mm -hmm. and who is in fact enforcing that, those provisions, whether it's the tenant who has to bring it to your attention or it's the landlord who has a reporting obligation and then the city has an oversight obligation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you listen to your city manager about resources, that's another resource if the city's going to take on another responsibility mm -hmm. in the affordable housing and, and rent control area. Right. Yeah, this conversation just came up with a very important mobile home park in our community where they were not were not permitting them to close, so they're trying to just price people out of their units. Um, and it was the tenants that brought that to our um, attention. Um, but there's so many other, I think, um, landlords in our community that if if the tenant doesn't have the resources or doesn't feel protected, how are they going to come to the government? What mechanism? Why don't we put that on the landlords to tell us yearly what their increases are um, to ensure that compliance? The second uh, question I had um, does dovetail with keeping our resources local. And that is the ordinance that was recently passed in the city of Santa Cruz. So in that jurisdiction, um, unfortunately, in our state, there are some city and county bad actors. Um, and the city of Hanford, I'll call them right out, frankly, moved someone to the city of Santa Cruz without any resources whatsoever in the city of Santa Cruz. That was a um, unhoused person, unsheltered person, and was only caught because Santa Cruz police saw Hanford police um, putting her in the street, essentially. Um, even though that we haven't actually seen that specific scenario happening here, I am interested in a similar ordinance for the city of Santa Cruz uh, to decentivize that sort of behavior from jurisdictions that are very far away from us doing something similar here. So I'd like just a conversation around that. Council member, I spent some time um, looking into the Santa Cruz regulations and, and you know, I've watched that city council hearing and looked into the facts behind what had occurred there. Um, and based upon what is in the council meeting and what's been reported, it was pretty egregious that, mm -hmm. you know, an un unsolicited um, per person was just dropped off mm -hmm. with no services, no connection to the community, at least based on what's been reported publicly. Um, it was definitely situationally driven, if you will, in that they were re reacting to a certain um, circumstance. I think there are some legal issues we would want to look into related to similar regulations. Mm -hmm. Um, I think their regulations were pretty narrowly crafted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't want to impinge on someone's right to travel right. or right. if someone really does have a family connection or another connection to your community. I'm aware of other jurisdictions where the police department worked hard to help individuals relocate to areas where they had services and family and reconnect them with family. It's not always possible. Um, so I think that would have to be carefully crafted and narrowly drawn mm -hmm. so that you're solving the problem and not running into other okay. legal constraints. Um, one of the notes I made is, you know, that we want to ensure you're not spending your money. We want to do the best we can mm -hmm. to ensure you're not spending your money on legal is issues and having to defend um, so you put you in the best spot to defend any challenges that may arise. So. Thank you. Council Member Montesino. All right. I think it's working. Hello, hello. Um, uh, I, you know, one one of my, you know, I get on my chat boxes, you know, all the time, you know, uh, people that in council know me. But uh, you know, we're 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 going into the downtown specific time. We, you know, um, in the community, and we're, uh, you know, a lot of apartment uh, it's are going to go, which are great in concept. But like I said, there's no entry level for 
for a young, a young family or a young individual because they can't afford to leave the house. So how do we, is, is there a way that we can, you know, because other developers are, are building these, these units as, you know, rents or leases. And how do we incentivize them to, you know, you know, for them to be sold at least or at least a percentage. So it's a, it becomes an entry level for a young person or a young family, the, uh, an entry level to some, you know, come wealth, you know. It, it, sure. I mean, affordable for sale housing is difficult. Um, there's no question about it. And, um, you know, the ability to develop generational wealth, as you all well know, is something that hasn't been offered and uh, hasn't been an opportunity for everybody in our country, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And I think um, a lot of jurisdictions are looking as you are to try and find ways to do that. I believe at your planning commission meeting just last Tuesday, um, some units, some for sale units were approved that included inclusionary units. I think well, may have only been one inclusion, maybe more than one. I'm looking to your community development director. Okay, so there's a habitat um, project that's, the habitat project was 13 for sale units um, that are available to low, lower income households. And then you have a market rate project that was also just approved that was four, five units total, one of them is affordable. So your inclusionary ordinance is one mechanism. It's slow and you know, the, the um, the amount of oversight to deal with um, for sale affordable housing is also something that takes a lot of staff resources and um, something that you have to have somebody devoted to that program. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm talking about like the 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 downtown units, like you know we're we're envisioning four thousand, you know, uh, so four thousand five thousand units. You know, can we? You know, is there a way or a mechanism that that we can? You know. Um, put, you know, the developers are going to be, you know, holistically or, you know, putting these units, some of them to be not affordable, but for sale. I, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the way, you know, it, they would be condo units, right? So you'd want to incentivize and make it easier for somebody to develop those units as con condominiums versus apartments. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it comes down to probably profitability for the developers and how, you know, that pencils out with their project. This isn't the question that you asked, but I'm going to take the opportunity to add this too. There are provisions in state law that allow ADUs to be sold separately from the main dwelling. Mm -hmm. There's an instance where you have to do it, and it's for a very limited um, set of circumstances where those ADUs are owned and controlled by certain types of organizations or nonprofits. The um, city has the ability to add regulations to allow ADUs to be transferred separately from the main a primary dwelling unit, which sounds a little counterintuitive because if you're selling an accessory dwelling unit, it's no longer accessory to the primary dwelling unit. But those are <clears throat> things that we could explore for you if you're interested. Thank you. Other questions from council? All right, seeing none, I think we will bring it back. And I think we are ready to adjourn at this moment. All right. I do not have my gavel, so I won't be able to use my gavel. But thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate the uh, discussion and all of the really interesting and innovative ideas. Um, thank you again. And with that, have a great rest of your weekend. We are adjourned. <laughs>